Welcome to Ankh Morpork. So, uh, I am dead, right? It would seem our meeting is somewhat premature. Death is a kind of interdimensional courier collecting souls from all over the multiverse. And the thing about Death is he's uh, hugely unappreciated. No, of course you didn't. Nobody ever listens to Death. Nobody ever thinks about Death. Death wants Please. Vines just to say, you know, uh, how are you doing? And Death is quite pissed off that he doesn't. But it's the beginning of a very key relationship in the show. And Death will ultimately become an ally of the Watch as they take on the big bads of the series who we reveal in a later episode. Uh, who's gonna save me? Detritus rescuing Sam Vimes and sacrificing himself for, to, to save Sam, I think is a really powerful moment. I think it works really well. There's a lovely tone that is both comic and then very quickly turning into tragedy. <laughs> so we always knew that we wanted Detritus in the show. I felt it was important that he needed to be a physical object, so we went down the prosthetic route. And it just kind of physicalizes him as a character, makes him feel really tactile and tangible and real and immediate. We were lucky enough to work with Craig McRae, who's a stunt performer. And we were also fortunate enough that he was already two meters tall. To start by 3D scanning his body, we were able to capture his likeness in 3D space. We projected onto a wall and we created a 2D cutout. That 2D cutout played a pinnacle part in establishing the size of the suit and how is he gonna move in the suit. My name is Craig McCray and I'm playing Detritus. This is the concept suit for Detritus. Um, they're just kind of sticking everything together, uh, getting a good feel of what it's gonna look like. We've got a show and tell today with the directors and producers. We're gonna get in the stilts with the feet on and see what that's like walking around. We ended up with a height of just under 2.5 meters where he felt comfortable. He was extended from the floor about 40 centimeters. And then obviously with the headpiece also giving us that extra length. So that was the, the design phase of getting to where and how this character is gonna look and move. Start on the side. We wanted to have a troll that felt like it was a living, breathing organism. So we had the rock formation, and then we decided to have this kind of intravenous network of vines that were holding it together, so that you could see that there was moss, or there was growth, or there was something within this rock that was actually living and breathing. Sometimes it can be hard to humanize these characters that are not human. And Clinton definitely found a way to do that in terms of adding additional details to some of the dental work, some of the contacts, uh, the movement of the face, to make sure that we could actually see all of the expressions that Craig, the actor, playing Detritus, was actually performing behind the mask. The suit generates a huge amount of heat because every inch of my body is absolutely covered. So we have to have a special suit that will uh, help cool me off while I'm inside. I'm quite a fit guy, I'm fairly strong. I was decimated the first time I got into that suit. And I mean, just walking in a straight line was a challenge. Very, very impressive. The one thing that really brought the character to life, I must say, is the performer, is Craig. Without him, it would just be a rubber suit on the floor. And the little nuances that he brought really helped sell the gag. Here's your buddy. My big buddy. For instance, we had arm extensions with him just pulling a little string on the inside you know, it just brings that extra bit of life or, or him just doing something with his brow and there's another piece of uh, rock glued to that. Those little elements and nuances really brings it to life. When I got there on the day, I discovered that we were on, an, on a decline and I had to run from the, the high ground down into the low ground. 
There was sand on the ground. I had to hit multiple marks and hit multiple acting beats while trying to stay in this moment as well as an actor and trying to embody the character. So with the suit, it was incredibly demanding because I had to run in these stilts and kind of dive in front of limes and take the bolt hit into the neck. And a few times during just that run, we had a few breakages on the stilts and uh, I took a couple of tumbles. Using those hands and kind of having to grab Vimes and protect him, still have the acting moments and have all of that richness while dealing with what was happening physically inside of the suit. It was quite a challenging day, overheating and sweating, and throbbing headache from the physical demand. Once I'd fallen down, then we could really focus on kind of those last few moments between Vimes and detritus. I hope it really read on screen. I hope that people can feel that kind of energy that we, we had between us there because it was palpable on set on the day we could feel it. Why'd you have to go and save me again? You saved me. You saved all of us. So. The death of Detritus was, uh, I don't know, I find it really kind of touched me because I really felt, I felt a lot of love for that character, Detritus, because he's so gentle and selfless. He's everything that we all want to be. And uh, seeing him cut down like that really affected me in some way. If you believe in the moment, the world just melts away and you're there and you're vaguely aware of cameras and crew and everybody else. So in episode two, once Detritus has made his ultimate sacrifice, Sam is left drunk in a bar trying to drown his sorrows. But Carrot, the new police officer, says, but hang on a second, this is, this is a genuine crime. This hasn't been regulated by Lord Veterinari. Surely this is something we can investigate. None of us took seriously. We had somebody stole from the Unseen You're University for Carter. We'd only exchange, we'd only exchange for enough slap to sink a city. So the lost library book that felt like a bit of a misdirect in episode one, in episode two, it becomes the most important thing in their lives because now they need to find this book that can control a dragon that is in Carter Dunn's hands. Listen and learn, Constable. Arch Chancellor. So they go to Unseen University and they challenge the Arch Chancellor who runs Unseen University to say what was in this book, who made it, what does it mean, how can we get hold of it. The Arch Chancellor denies all knowledge and they discover within the library of Unseen University this, this space called the Reading Room. You fight the encyclopedias, I'll fight Angua and Chiri explore Unseen University's library core where the reading room is, a special room that has powers to allow people to enter into the headspace of others, to read their minds. It's okay. It's okay. Angua and Chiri meet the librarian, and the librarian tells them that the book was stolen and that it was taken from the shelves by someone that must have been inside the library itself. What they realize upon entering, it's once who is responsible for taking the book. And actually, she's been working with Casa. Once is a former gang member of Casa's gang. She grew up with Vimes and went to jail, was betrayed by Vimes along with Casa. Uh, she got left in jail. And when she came out, she wanted to be a wizard. Um, even though in that world, you can't really be a wizard if you're a woman. But she went to the university where they study wizardry, and through a series of events, she became a cleaner. Carsa uses her as a sort of hench person, and she escapes the library, uh, having got what she needs from the reading room, leaving the Arch-Chancellor and our gang of heroes facing armed goblins. And we leave that with Angler using the moon to turn into a werewolf to save everybody. I know why you're terrified. The moon. Better run, then. You're the danger. I decide who sees me and when. Understand? Angua is the refugee. You know, she's um, had to leave her land her people, her pack, and has had to go and find a place to hide and not hurt anyone. I think on the outside, she comes across strong, fearless, but deep down, she's riddled with fear. 
fear of what she could do to people she loves. And I think that's why it's so hard for her to let people in. Her lupine ability, the fact that she's a werewolf, is what saves the day in episode two. But that leaves Angua in quite a bereft place at the end of the episode because she's starting to think, well, this is great, you know, suddenly the watch is doing something, but I'm not going to get to be a part of that story because look what happens. Yeah, it worked for us this time, but next time it might not. Next time I might eat all of you guys. And Cheery, who is a dear friend of Angua's, has figured out a way of managing that and has, has built this kind of barometer for Angua that means that Angua can get some intelligence on what the weather's going to be like so she can figure out in advance whether or not she can get out on a night beat with the rest of the guys. And so it's about inclusion. And so it's not only just a key beat in their story, but I think it's a really totemic, powerful moment of defiance for the show where the show is saying to the audience, we want to include people. Everyone is invited and you have to make allowances and adjustments and that's what that beat is about. Hey, it's Lisa. Did you know that the TV show with the most amount of Emmy Awards is Saturday Night Live? Since its beginnings in 1975, the show has won 54 awards and has been nominated 242 times. Now, do you like my shirt? Are you a sleep-deprived binge watcher? You need to get one of these shirts. Click on the link in the description.